Hi, it's me, Frank Lennon. Here I am, next to a massive teapot. In the last couple of weeks, we've spent some time talking about virtual memory. The first solution that we saw to virtual memory was this idea of base and bounds. With a process that the operating system is starting, we're going to allocate its entire address space into physical memory. And we're going to get some help from the hardware in terms of translating the virtual addresses that are within that address space into the physical addresses that are actually in memory. So where we've actually put that address space in physical memory. This was pretty simple in that we really only require two registers to help us get this virtual memory system working. We needed a base register to tell the hardware where this virtual address space starts in physical memory. And we needed a bounds register, one to say where this virtual address space ends in memory. The main problem that we saw with that was that there was this internal fragmentation. We've got this chunk of memory in the middle of this virtual address space that's been allocated, but is almost never actually going to be used. We've got this, the heap growing down and the stack growing up, but most processes will never actually use any of that space in between those two segments. So we generalized upon this idea of base and bounds, and we took advantage of this idea that we knew about different kinds of parts of memory. The different kinds of parts of memory that we were looking at were the code section, the heap section, and the stack section. We used these three pieces that we knew about, and we changed the way that we allocate parts of this virtual address space in main memory. We, instead of allocating the entire address space, we allocate only segments of this address space. This approach, segmentation, is a little bit more complicated in that we now have multiple sets of registers per process. So one set of registers per segment of the process. So one that corresponds to the code section, one that corresponds to the heap section, and one that corresponds to the stack section. This solves that issue of internal fragmentation. We no longer have this giant chunk of memory in between those two segments that's allocated but not used. But now we have a problem of external fragmentation. These segments that we're allocating, we're allocating them in memory, but we're allowing those segments to have different sizes. The heap, for example, is going to grow as the user process actually increases the amount of dynamic memory that it requires. So now we've introduced this problem of external fragmentation. We've made it slightly more complicated. It works a little bit better in one case. We have a lot more free memory to put more processes in, but we've got a new problem with this external fragmentation. This eventually led us to taking a look at free space management. And with free space management, we're kind of looking at things from the user process side, even, even though it's effectively the same problem that the operating system has when it has to deal with segments. Segments are not used in practice, not anymore. In fact, if we were to take a look at the Linux kernel to see how segments were implemented in that, one thing that we would find is that this is an extremely architecture specific thing. In fact, the only recognizable architecture that supports segmentation as far as we're concerned about is x86. So segmentation, it, it is a real solution to this problem, but it's no longer something that's really used in practice on real hardware. Where we're going with this now is into something called paging. And the basic idea with paging is that instead of allowing these segments that we've got with segmentation to have different sizes, we're instead going to separate address spaces into fixed sized chunks called pages. The fixed size pages that we're going to logically separate this address space into are significantly smaller than the segments that we had been looking at previously and they're fixed in size. We can't grow a page once it's been allocated. All we can do is allocate a new page for a process. We're logically separating virtual address spaces into pages. We're also now going to logically separate physical memory into page frames. 
So virtual memory is separated logically into fixed size chunks called pages. Physical memory is logically separated into fixed size chunks called page frames. You can, you can kind of think of this as physical memory being separated into a fixed size set of boxes, mailboxes, drawers, and the, the pages that we've logically separated our process into are boxes that are all the same size that will fit into these drawers just perfectly. There's one page per page frame. There's exactly one page per page frame. The main positive property of segmentation was that it was really not much in terms of space requirements and it was very fast, all things considered. The hardware was able to basically do everything for us as soon as we had introduced this idea of the base and bounds registers. We want to try to retain these properties, not taking up a lot of space and being fast. Those are our main goals with this approach to solving the problem of virtual managing virtual memory with pages. Unfortunately for us, we're, we're not going to see the solutions to both of those problems, but we'll, we'll see the solution to at least one of those problems with paging. So let's start by taking a quick look at figure 18.1 here. Figure 18.1 is a simple 64 byte address space. This is a lot smaller than the 16 kilobyte address spaces that we were looking at previously when we were talking about segmentation, and it's unrealistically small. 64 bytes is such a small amount of memory that it's difficult to even imagine a system running with this, but it's fine for illustrating the point. This is a 64 byte address space, and the page size that we've logically separated this address space into is 16 bytes. So each of the segments that you see here, each of the pages that you see here are 16 bytes in size. I want you to remember that this is an address space and whenever we're talking about address spaces, we are explicitly talking about virtual addresses. So we are not talking about physical memory right now, we're talking about virtual addresses. Let's also take a look at figure 18.2. In figure 18.2, we have 128 bytes of physical memory, so we could, in theory, if we were allocating full address spaces, only support two processes in this entire physical memory. It's 128 bytes of physical memory, and it uses the exact same size for page frames as our address space does for pages. So the page size and the page frame size in physical memory have to be exactly the same as each other. So they're both 16 bytes here. This is similar to the other diagrams that we've seen in terms of segmentation in that this is physical memory and the operating system here has reserved one page frame for its own use. So the operating system has to have some part of physical memory for it to keep its own stuff like process control blocks and all of the other data and structures that the operating system needs to run the system. One thing that this immediately solves for us compared to segmentation is that free space management is now a trivial problem. Remember that with segmentation, one of the problems that this operating system had with these variable sized segments was that as segments are added and removed from main memory, from physical memory, we had to go through this process of finding spots that are big enough to hold the segment that we want and possibly moving segments around. So relocating segments at runtime. That was the whole point of discussing free space management. Again, we can't really see this in practice anymore because segmentation is not really something that's used anymore. Using fixed size pages solve this, solves this problem entirely. We don't have to find a space that's big enough because all spaces are exactly the same size. There's no thing, there's nothing for us to look for other than a free page frame that's available for us to put a page into. The operating system then can really trivially just keep track of a list of free pages. And this is something that could be referred to as the free list. In figure 18.2, the free list that the operating system would keep track of here would be to say that page, page frames 1, 4, and 6 are, are free. They're not currently used 
by any running processes. So when a page is requested, a new page is requested to be used by the operating system, it can just use this list of free page frames to say, hey, I'm gonna put you in this spot right here. With segmentation, we were really explicitly using this idea of the stack and the heap and the code segments. And we're still going to sort of think about those things in terms of paging, but we're abstracting ourselves away from that now. We're going to get to looking at these three segments again, but the whole point of this paging idea is that we don't have to think about those segments specifically. We're abstracting in the way the details of what memory is actually being used for with pages. With segmentation, the operating system tracked where the segments were in the process control block, and we kind of have to do something similar with paging. The difference between segmentation and paging is that with segmentation, we had a fixed number of segments. So that kind of meant that we also had a fixed number of values that the operating system needed to keep track of in the process control block. So we needed to keep a base and bounds pair or a base and size pair for each of the segments for each process. And that's kind of limited to just going to be three sets of these per process. With paging, we've remember we're fixing these page sizes at much, much smaller than the sizes of the segments that we were allocating before. And that kind of means that for us to support things like fairly large size heaps, we have to let the process request new pages at runtime and that means that we can't know in advance at compile time, we can't know when this thing starts, how many pages it's going to be using in the same way that we could with segments. We knew that it was going to use three segments. We can't know this with, with paging. Huh. <laughs> My phone is too hot. With paging, the operating system still keeps track of this stuff on a per process basis but it keeps track of it now in a structure called a page table. And the page table is a mapping between virtual addresses and physical addresses. So here, here's an example process control block. In this process control block, we're keeping track of things like accounting, so think back to scheduling, how much time this process has actually spent on the processor. We're keeping track of the number of files and the files that this process has open. So we're keeping track of which files this process has used the open system call to try and open on the file system. And finally, now we've got the page table. There's lots and lots of other stuff, but we're just stopping here at the page table. Abs really abstractly, the page table is going to have two parts. It's going to have virtual page numbers. This is that logical organization of the address space for a process. So these are the virtual page numbers in that address space and we're mapping those to physical page frames. Here, page number zero, virtual page number zero, is mapped to physical frame number three. And this is the mapping between figures 18.1 and 18.2. Really similar to, to segments, again, this is a per process thing. So this is something that would be kept in the process control block for a process. Let's take a look at an example of executing a, an instruction in a process that's running in that same 64 byte virtual address space that we had looked at before. So the instruction here is a move instruction. We've got a virtual address and we're trying to load something from memory into this register EAX. To do this instruction, to actually decode this virtual address, we did actually have to go through this entire process of translating virtual addresses into physical addresses to load the instruction itself, to fetch the instruction. But we're just gonna assume that we've done this already. The instruction is currently on the processor waiting to be executed. The virtual address that we're going to be using here, because we have a 64 byte address space is six bits. So two to the power of six is 64. That gives us the address space that we've got. And it kind of looks like this. Really similar to the explicit approach with segmentation, where we used addresses and decoded them to figure out which segment was being referred to. 
we're going to use the address itself to determine the virtual page number and the offset within that page number. So remember, with segmentation, we were trying to figure out which segment we were looking at and the offset within that segment. And the same is true here. We're trying to figure out which page number we're looking at, virtual page number, and the offset within that virtual page number. Here, the virtual page number uses the top two bits of this address, and then the bottom four bits of our six-bit address are used as the offset itself. We have 16 byte page sizes in this 64 byte address space. So that means that we have four pages, four virtual pages that we could be looking at. And that's where we get this two bits from. We can have four possible values here. So there are four 16 byte pages in our virtual address space. The remaining bits then are the offset. And this is how we get to a specific location within that page itself. Let's take this to be a slightly more concrete example now. So that was really abstractly, here's a virtual address. Let's make this slightly more concrete and we'll use an actual address here. So in this case, we're doing move again, but we've replaced virtual address with an actual literal value 21. So load from address 21 into this register EAX. This address 21, this virtual address 21 is decoded as 010101. The virtual page number here is number one. So the virtual page number is one and the offset within that is 101. In figure 18.3 now, we're actually taking this address 21 and we're translating it into a physical address. There's two halves to this. The first part is translating this virtual page number into a physical address, a physical frame number. We take that VPN part of the address and we push it through this address translation square, this gray box. This is the MMU for our processor, the memory management unit. We're going from this virtual page number of 01 through this virtual, uh, through this address translation box where what's going to happen here is that the hardware is going to look up this value in something called a page table. We'll get to this. Something happens. And what we get out the other side is the corresponding physical frame number that this page is stored in. The offset just goes straight through. We do not translate the offset because that's an offset relative to the start of this page. The offset is relative to the start of the page and therefore it's relative to the start of the frame in exactly the same way. So we've got an ability to do these translations. Now we've got to start thinking about how the page table itself is organized. Right now, what we've got is effectively a system that can do translations between virtual page numbers and physical frame numbers. And we can translate therefore virtual addresses with the offset into physical addresses with an offset. The problem is, where, where do we actually put all these things? So where do we put these virtual to physical mappings? And you're probably saying to yourself in the process control block, because, you know, you, you said that four or five times. Yeah, yes. OK, yes, of course. We have to put this information in the process control block. This is a per process thing, and therefore it can go in the process control block for a specific process. The problem though is that page tables can get really, really, really big. We've been looking at an example here with 64 byte address spaces. 64 byte address spaces give us six bit addresses, six bit virtual addresses. Six bits, you know, when you do the arithmetic, isn't even eight bits. And eight bit computing has been around since, you know, like 1971. With six bits and four pages per process, we're basically at the same space requirements that we would have been with segmentation. Three sets of registers for each process. If we scale this paging concept up, though, into something that's a little bit more realistic. So let's scale this up to 32-bit addresses with four kilobyte pages. 
32-bit address spaces with four kilobyte pages means that we're separating our 32-bit addresses into 20-bit virtual page numbers. So we have 20 bits of the 32-bit address to have a page number reference and then a 12 bits for offset. We're, we're decoding this based on the size of the page that we're, we've selected. So four kilobytes is the page size that we've selected. That means that we need uh, offsets that are up to four kilobytes. And then that, that's where we get the 12 bits from. Two to the 12 is 4096. And then the remaining are for the page numbers. With 20-bit virtual page numbers, that means that the operating system has to keep track of translations between two to the 20 virtual addresses, virtual pages and physical page frames. That's about a million page frames. It's really specifically, it's two to the 20, so it's 1,048,576 pages. If we assume that each page table entry, PTE, if we assume that each page table entry is four bytes, that means that each process has to have about four megabytes of translations between virtual page numbers and physical frame numbers. Assuming that we've got about a hundred processes running on a system, and when I was writing all this down, I actually had 250 processes running on my Windows system. If we have a hundred processes, that means that 400 megabytes of memory is being used by the operating system only to keep track of translations between virtual page numbers and physical frame numbers. And that's bonkers. That's getting into the realm of how much memory Chrome uses. This is for 32-bit addresses. Most or all systems that we're running on our desktops or in our pockets are 64-bit address spaces, 64-bit address, 48-bit technically, 48-bit technically, but 64-bit systems. That's going to be unimaginably huge if we were to use the same page size. So where can we put it? We want the CPU and the MMU to be able, the memory management unit, to be able to access these page tables. It's responsible for doing these virtual address to physical address translation, so it needs to be able to access these pages, these page tables. The problem is that most modern CPUs max out at like 16 megabytes of on-die cache memory, and that cache memory is already allocated for use somewhere else. Adding even more memory to this would be prohibitively expensive. You'd be spending more money on the memory that's attached to the processor than the processor itself. So assuming that we're going to keep these giant page tables, we're not, but honestly, this assumption is still gonna stick. Assuming that we're keeping these giant page tables, the only place that we have in the machine that's big enough in terms of memory to actually put these page tables it's in memory itself. Figure 18.4 is showing something similar to what we saw in figure 18.2, but now we've added to this that part of what the operating system is keeping in page frame zero in the one that was allocated for itself is a page table. So what this is showing is that the page table here is going to be using pages three, seven, five, and two. So this is the process uh, that's running on the system, the one process that's running on this system. The CPU is going to be told by the operating system, it has some hardware for us to tell it where the page table starts so that it can use that page table to do these translations for us. So now we've got a page table, it's in memory, but what does the page table actually look like? Well, the page table is a table. This is actually just a kind of fancy way of saying that it's, a, it's an array. And to be clear, a uh, hash table, while it uses a similar name, would be a really terrible choice to implement a page table. Instead, what we're going to look at right now is a linear page table. And that, that literally is just an array. And we're literally just using indexes in the array, as opposed to actually having separate parts for the virtual page number and the physical page number. So here in this diagram, what I'm trying to show is that while I showed this virtual to physical mapping previously as two separate columns, 
In reality, what we've got in this linear page table is just one column, and we use the indexes in that, call, in that, uh, in that array as the virtual page number. So previously we'd said virtual page number zero corresponds to physical frame number three explicitly in two separate columns. Now we're saying virtual page number zero is attached to physical frame number three just because it's in spot zero of this array. What kind of stuff would we put into a page table entry now? So what goes into this slot in our array? One thing that we can put in there is a valid bit. A valid bit is something that we're going to be using to say whether or not a process has actually requested that this page be used. If a process tries to conduct a translation between a page number, a virtual page number, and a physical page number, the page table entry will have a valid bit that says whether or not this process has actually allocated that page for something previously. The hardware is going to use this valid bit to check to see if it should raise a fault, segmentation fault, to see if it should raise a fault if the process tries to conduct a translation between a virtual address that it hasn't allocated and a physical frame that isn't allocated for it. We've also got some other things like protection bits. And this is going to be what's used to indicate whether or not a, a page should be readable, whether it should be writable, and whether it should be executable. And that kind of goes back to segmentation. With segmentation, we had protection bits and we explicitly marked, for example, the code segment to be readable and executable, but not writable. And we've got the same general idea here. Figure 18.5 is showing of a page table entry for an x86 architecture machine. Page table entries are going to be architecture specific, so per type of processor that you've got. A page table entry for an ARM processor will look different from a page table entry for, for, for an x86 processor. Remember, this is what's being used to map between a virtual page number and a physical frame number. So we don't actually keep the virtual page number in this address and we don't keep the full address in this. This is only going to be between pages and page frames. The page frame number itself is 20 bits wide and it's followed by an unused block of three bits. After that, we've got some bits that are going to be used for caching purposes. So this is outside the scope of this course, but this is the G, PAT, PWT, PCD, A, and D bits. We've got a present bit that maps pretty directly to what I just described as the valid bit. We've got read and write bits, and we've got a privilege bit. The privilege bit is used to indicate whether or not this is an operating system page or whether it's a user process page. You can find a lot more information about this Intel specific page table entry structure by looking at the Intel architecture manuals. They're about 5,000 pages long, so you might not want to look at that. So page tables are, they're too big. They're really, really big, uh, especially when we look at them in their really basic form. They're also really slow. And the reason that they're really slow is that we've got to do a lot of translations to get to the point of what we want to do, virtual address to physical address. Let's step through what the MMU would be abstractly doing when it gets a virtual page number, when it gets a virtual address and tries to translate that into a physical address. So this is the same instruction that we looked at before. It's a move instruction. It's got virtual address 21, and we're trying to load what's in virtual address 21 into uh, EAX, the register EAX. The thing that we're trying to do here is to translate the virtual address 21 into its corresponding physical address. We need to basically figure out what page virtual address 21 is in so that we can look up its corresponding page frame, its physical page frame in the page table. Here's a little bit of pseudocode that's gonna step us through what's actually happening to do this, to actually get through the process of extracting these bits that represent the virtual page number. The top line here, VPN is equal to, is isolating the page number. The first thing that we do is we mask off the virtual page number bits. 
So VPN mask here is set to 110000. So this is a six bit address. The top two bits are set in this mask and we're doing a, a bitwise AND. So everything else is gonna be explicitly set to zero. And then we're shifting. So we're shifting to uh, the, the right and we're shifting four bits to get those two bits from the top. The second line then is fetching the page table itself, the page table entry. We're getting the page table entry address by starting with the page table base register. So now this is how the operating system is going to tell the hardware where to look in memory for this page table, for this process. Before we had registers for segments and size, now we have a register for the page table and the rest of the translations are in memory itself. So the page table address, the page table entry address is the page table register and we're gonna add to that the virtual page number multiplied by the size of a page table entry. So this is getting us to the index in the page table that corresponds to this virtual page number. Once we know the table entry, then we can have the physical page frame number. We get that out of that page table entry and we can phys figure out then the physical address of this, this virtual address that's been requested. First, we get the offset and to get the offset, we do a bitwise AND on the virtual address. An offset mask here would be the kind of the inverted or the opposite of the not of uh, the VPN mask. So 0011111. And then the physical address here is we're going to shift the physical frame number to the left four bits and we're going to OR to that the offset. So now we're reconstructing that physical address. So figure 18.6 is stepping through this in a lot more detail. We've got that first line, so this is on line two. We're extracting the virtual page number. On line five, we're getting the page table entry address. On line six, we're getting the page table entry. So line five is just getting the address of the page table entry. Line eight is getting the page table entry itself and putting it into this variable called PTE. On lines 10 through 19, now we're actually going to start doing these checks and virtual to physical address translation. The first thing we check is, has this page table entry been allocated? Has this process actually allocated or requested that this page, page and page frame be allocated? If it hasn't been, that valid bit is false, then we raise a segmentation fault. The next one is checking, do we have permissions to access this page? So this process has allocated this page or it has been allocated by the operating system. We have to check if we have permissions to refer to this physical address and virtual address. And if we don't have permission, then we raise a protection fault. And finally, we actually do that translation. And then finally, we say register is equal to access memory of the physical address itself. All of this is really to say that virtual to physical address translation takes a lot of work. Outside of executing instructions, the CPU and the MMU are going to have to do a ton of work to go through the process of just translating that virtual address into a physical address, including accessing memory itself, which is way, way slower than the CPU is actually able to run at. We're not going to look at how to improve the performance of this. Ultimately, all of these steps have to happen. They have to happen because we're putting these page tables in physical memory. The CPU has to step down into physical memory to do these translations. The solution to making it faster is translation look aside buffers. And these are just tiny caches that are on the CPU specifically for address translations. And you can read a little bit more about that in chapter 19, but that's not required for us this term. The last thing that we're going to do here is take a look at this in terms of how an actual program might execute and the translations that need to take place as that program is actually executing. So let's take a look at a, a simple, really simple program here. This is a small program in C that initializes an array of thousand integers and it just loops through that array of a thousand integers and sets them all to zero. That's, that's it, that's all it does. If we compile this program and then we disassemble it, so we compile it down to machine code, 
and then we disassemble it back into the assembly language instructions, this is approximately what it would look like. First, we're moving a literal value of zero into a spot. We're incrementing EAX. We're comparing EAX to I, which is 0x03 E8 here. And then we're jumping a not equal to uh, 1024. So just back up to the top of the loop. We're going to assume that when we're running this example, we're running in a virtual address space of 64 kilobytes with one kilobyte page sizes. So this is a little bit different than the examples we've been looking at before with like byte, pint size byte address spaces, but it's still quite small. Let's say that the physical location of the page table is 1024. So that's going to put it in the second frame of physical memory. The contents of the page table are effectively going to be where the code lives and where the array lives. The virtual address for the code that we're looking at here starts at 1024. Since pages are one kilobyte in size, that means that this code segment starts in the second page, virtual page. So this is page one because we're doing zero based addressing here. The only sane way to do addressing. We're also going to further say that the translation between the virtual page number one and physical memory is that we put virtual page number one into physical frame number four. The virtual address for the... Oh, okay. Beep, beep. This array consumes about 4,000 bytes. We'll say that these integers are four bytes in size. So we're gonna need a total of four pages to map this entire virtual addresses for the array into physical addresses. So we're gonna say that these are virtual page numbers 39 through 42. And we're gonna say that virtual page number 39 maps to physical frame seven, virtual page number 40 maps to physical frame eight, and virtual page number 41 maps to physical frame nine. And finally, virtual page number 42 maps to physical frame 10. So both of them are contiguous with each other. Figure 18.7 is confusing. Figure 18.7 is showing over time as this program is executing a bunch of different things. It's showing the access patterns of memory on both virtual addresses and physical addresses. Let's take a little bit of a look at this here. Starting on the left side of this diagram, is starting on the left side of this diagram is time point zero. Time point zero is where this process is starting up basically. The first thing that has to happen here is that we're going to fetch this instruction from memory and that means that we're going to have to refer to the page table entry, page table at entry one. We're fetching this instruction, uh, move L, and we're loading that into the processor so it can be executed. The next time point here is going to be on the bottom in the code section. And now we're going to be translating, we're going to be starting to execute this move instruction. So to execute the move instruction, we have to translate the address of the first element in the array. And so that's page table 39 here at the very top. Then we move down to the move part, and this is the array actually moving that value into the array. And we have to do that translation again. We complete the move, and then we have to fetch the next instruction from memory. So we go back up to the page table entry one to do the translation to get the next instruction from memory. The next instruction in memory is that ink instruction. Then we fetch the next instruction from memory, and we have to do another translation. We do that translation to get page table entry number one again, and we get the comp instruction. Then we do another fetch from memory to get the next instruction. We have to do the page table entry reference, page table entry one, and then we have to do the JNE instruction. Once we do the JNE instruction, we're, we're still just working on the first iteration of this loop. The JNE is going to go back up to the top of the loop and we fetch the next instruction. So that's going to go back to the page table. It's going to fetch instruction zero at 1024, which is that move instruction again. Then we do the actual move. We have to decode the address that we're moving into at the top of this diagram. We have to do the move in the array. So actually do the array translation itself. And then we kind of keep doing this. So this pattern is cycling 
you can see on the very bottom the cycle of instructions that are being executed. You can see in the middle over time, we're increasing slowly the array entries that we're referring to. And you can see in the top part here, which page table entries we're looking at. The page table entries that we have here are never increasing because we're still only looking at the first page of translations for this. Even though we're slowly increasing the array, the actual address that we're looking at, the page number never changes in this diagram. So one thing to try and think about here is what would that look like? If we expanded this over the entire thousand element array, how would this diagram change? What would that pattern actually look like? All of this now is to say that paging and, and really virtual address translation in general is it's really slow. There's a lot of moving parts in this and there's a lot of different pieces that are working together to translate these addresses effectively so that we can relocate processes in memory so that we can not allocate entire address spaces in memory and so that we can isolate processes from one another in memory. So in summary here, paging solves this problem of external fragmentation that was introduced by segmentation. That's really great, but it's also introducing problems of its own. In its really basic form, it takes up a lot of space. Again, assuming that we were allocating these really small chunks, we were talking about hundreds of megabytes per process, scaling up to real address sizes, address spaces on real machines, it's not really feasible to do this. It's also really, really slow because we constantly have to be going back into memory. The memory management units and the CPU are constantly having to refer back to memory in the page table to conduct these virtual to physical translations. Chapter 19, again, looking at translation look-aside buffers, is going to try and solve this problem of speed by caching entries, but you're not required to read that. You're welcome to do that if you want, but you're not required to. Chapter 20, which you are required to read, is going to be looking at solving the space problem that's related to these page tables. And the way that we're gonna solve this problem with, with space is to use indirection. We're gonna look at building multi-level page tables as opposed to these single level linear page tables. Kind of like not allocating the entire address space and only allocating chunks of it. Now we're going to be looking at not allocating all of the pages for an address space. Neat. So that's it for paging. Thanks for listening and I'll, I'll see you soon.